everyone. Welcome to another episode of Pixel Feed Radio. And I'm here with my friend Jason. And Jason, I, I bet that you have the same problem that I have my whole life. I'm going to try to pronounce your last name because I tried multiple times and mine ends in the same letter. So I'm pretty, I think I have it. Voivovich. Voyovich. Voyovich. Very, very close. Yeah, it's uh, how do you say it? Voyovich. Voyovich. Okay, mine's low. Yeah, such. That's it. So, yeah, no, yeah. it's you know, it's uh, <laughs> it's Croatian. Croatian, yeah, yeah, yeah mine's Croatian that's, too. Yeah, we uh, it's, uh, I've got on I've got some of the paperwork from Ellis Island back uh-huh. in the early 1900s when my family came over uh, so from cool. the old country. And it's funny, there are four different ways to spell my name out mm-hmm. there. And if you find it, you might find a few different ways. It's because there were four different examiners at Ellis Island. And That's each one funny. kind of recorded what they heard a little bit differently. So mm-hmm. if you hear other Voyevichs and you see them spelled differently, we're all from the same tribe. It is the same tribe. I actually, what's funny is I'm actually Italian, but my grandfather was from Croatia. And that's where I get the last name, obviously, but the rest of the family is Italian. Uh, and... Um, it's funny because people, I tell them like I'm Italian and it's like, yeah, but my last name is Croatian. And when they're, you know, I'm not going to get into the whole history lesson here, but where I'm, where I'm from in Italy, that part of Italy, Trieste used to be part of Croatia. And then at world war two or somewhere on there, everything changed. And that's how it happened. Uh, but I do have friends who are Croatian here in South Florida and they always give me crap about it. It's like, ah, you're not Italian, you're Croatian. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> yeah, I guess, <laughs> you know, so it's all in good fun. But for those of you that don't know, Jason's a fellow marketer, and he wrote a book called Marketer in Chief, How Each President Sold the American Dream, which if you're in marketing and if you've never looked into this, you shouldn't be in marketing because it's always we're always selling, especially presidents. They have to sell somebody to get up there all the way to the top, and then they have to sell everybody else on, in, on you know their ideas, essentially. So uh, just briefly, let's talk briefly about the book, and then we'll go back to how everything started. But what's the book about in detail? Yeah, that yeah, the book in a nutshell is how each president it needed to convince the American people uh, to believe in this kind of nebulous idea called the United States. You know, it's funny, we don't think about the American idea really that way anymore. It's a country, it's been around for over 200 years. It's kind of like a smartphone. It's always been in your hands and you feel like it's always been there. But there was a time at which that was a brand new thing. You know, 1776, brand new thing, a government that relied on its authority only on the consent of the governed, that there was no king, there was no, the military didn't control it. It wasn't, you know, any other basis of authority was just the legal structure that it had. Well, that was an innovation. That was a brand new thing. So each you can think about each president as a person who needed to kind of continually kind of uh, set the marketing strategy for that new idea, because there's nothing backing it up. There's no like, Hey, if you don't, if you don't believe in me, the military is going to come and they're going to force you to be part of Massachusetts. That wasn't the way it was. So it was uh, marketing uh, and no one called it marketing at that time, of course, But that whole idea that you needed to persuade people to be part of your country versus force them to be there based on where they live was a totally new idea. So what I wanted to do in the book is chart that evolution over time. I wanted to, it was just curiosity for me. I wanted to see if I took a look at each president as a CMO, what would their challenges be? How did they handle it? How did they do really well? And how did they kind of F it up? And that was, some did really well, some didn't. That's totally okay. But it was, every story was informative for marketers today. You know, that's, we face the same challenges today, even though we might be separated by 100 years, 150, 200 years, we're all still facing, as marketers and salespeople, we run into the same problem. Storytelling, convincing people to believe in things, you know, using humor, handling insults investing in infrastructure. We do all of that stuff today. We might as well learn from people who came before us. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and for those of you that are listening and watching, trust me, we're going to get into the whole, you know, Trump election with Hillary because that was, um, if you're a marketer, you were watching that closely. I know all my colleagues and I were. But uh, before we get into the details of all that, why don't we go back? How did you get started in marketing? 
I'd, I've been in marketing really uh, my whole career. I, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't mistake my way into it. Uh, there's no shame in that, but I got into it because my family was, you know, I come from a family of immigrants and entrepreneurs. So you know, for them, all creative people, my dad was an advertising creative director in kind of the mad men era. So I grew up watching him work with clients in our home office you know, doing paste up, you know, doing ad campaigns, going on photo shoots with them. So I grew up around it. I grew up with people starting their own businesses. I never, you know, honestly, I never really knew how to do anything else. So yeah. for me, it was kind of natural. It's kind of like, yeah, I kind of went into my dad's business. Simple that's, as that. That's what I tell people all the time. Like, I, I, I mean, it wasn't advertising or marketing, but I come from a family of entrepreneurs uh, all the right. way back to like, great, great, great grandfather. <laughs> you know, I was the first one actually that had like, quote unquote, a real job at some point when I was a teenager and didn't work for uh, some type of the family business just because, you know, my dad didn't have his businesses here at the time uh, before, you know, when we moved to the States. But it makes a difference when you grow up around that environment. It's a different mindset. You know, I grew up, uh, I tell people all the time, like between my grandfather and my dad, I mean, we're very close. My grandfather and I were like, and I mean, I was... I was the first boy, you know, after two girls, grandson. So I was like, quote unquote, the chosen one type of deal. Like he would take me everywhere. And I remember still to this day, it's funny that you bring the madman area. Like I remember sitting in his office and I can still to this day, I can smell it like the cigarette because he used to be a chain smoker. I can smell the cigarette smell in my head. And I remember the calculator. I used to get in trouble all the time because I would start hitting the calculator number so the paper will roll out, you know, those old school oh, calculators. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I, rem I remember everything on his desk to this day. I remember exactly what everything was placed at, the ashtray, the, the calendar. The it, it just brings back those memories. And I used to sit uh, in meetings with them, both my dad and my grandfather, like important meetings. You know, I was sitting in their lap. And they're closing this like, I mean, they were in, in uh, you know, pipeline construction, you know, for oil in Venezuela. So we're talking about multi-million dollar deals. And I'm just sitting there like, hey, la, 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 you know, but all that stuff, man, all that stuff, it, it's ingrained in your head since you were a kid. So, you know, being in marketing yourself, I can, I can only imagine how much you learn from those days, right? It's, you know, it's crazy, you know, just, uh, I think, you know, my grandfather, set me in doing work on repair work on cars doing auto body work that was his that was his entrepreneurial venture he put cars back together mm -hmm. you know after rex uh and it was just different back then i don't know what it was but you take your kids uh in you know, at least my grandfather and my dad my other grandfather on the other side i'm a half cuban as well yeah. okay uh, my other grandfather made coffee filters and they'd that you're just part of the business there is no like well you're a kid you know you get to this when you're 18 or whatever but no they just brought you in as soon as you could walk and as soon as you could be helpful at all yeah they'd bring you into the business and i'm hoping that with kind of the pandemic and all the stuff that's gone on maybe the silver lining could be you know people are like oh, i don't want my kids around in my private office space like f that yeah. I want the kids in there. I mean, how much did I learn? How much did you learn, Kristen, by sitting with your your dad, your mom, while they were doing business? Why wouldn't you want that? That's uh, I'm just I'm I'm a, I'm a little blown away. I'm like, yeah, I get it that kids can be really distracting. I know I was a pain in the ass. Oh yeah, me too. Trust me. But yeah, but you learn, and that kind of gift that you get from your grandparents and your parents just by being present. Uh, and kind of learning like, hey, be quiet. I'm on the phone, you know, and I found most people on a video call. If you're like, oh, you got a cat or a dog or your kids. They everyone's don't care. Cool. Everyone's cool with it. Why? I, I don't know. I just it's too uptight. We need to we need to show kids what the work life is really like before they get into it. Otherwise, man, it's a rude awakening when you hit 22 and you get your first real job. Right. And it's nothing like what you thought man, that's a, that's tough to deal with. Here's the thing that I, the, uh, you know, I just, I just had my second kid a month ago. So he's a month Congratulations. Old. Thank you. And the first one's two years old and two boys. So obviously you look back and you're like, okay, what would I do differently than my parents did with me? Uh, the biggest mistake that my parents did and my family did with me, it's like, no matter what happens, this is all yours. 
So I'll res- like in the back of my head, I always had this thought, like if something goes down, like I don't have to do anything. Like I'm set for life, you know? And then my dad, long story short, it was beaten out of me at some point, but it took a while for me to change my mindset. Um, and, uh, and, you know, things happen. And this is in Venezuela with the, you know, everything that's going on down there. So that didn't even help. But uh, my rule for my kids, and, and this is just me because I don't want them to grow up to be like entitled or anything like that. It's like, listen, here's all my books and I will give you a list. It's like, this is the first one you're going to read and you work your way down. And hopefully I can, you know, get them to start reading these books when they're like in their young teens or whatever, some, somewhere at that point to get that mentality going. But in my rule is going to be like, I don't want you to do what I do. I want you to do what makes you happy. And if, right. if, if, if for you to get somewhere where you do what makes you happy, uh, it, it means that you have to get a job doing something you hate just to raise the capital. I want you to do that as well. My right. second rule is like, yeah, you'll work with me growing up. And if you want to, you're more than welcome to work with me. I want you to. But guess what? At some point when you're a teenager or in college, because I want you to go to college too, you're going to work at a restaurant or you're going to work at a, re- yeah. a retail store. I don't care if it's only one month. I want you to feel, I, I want you to see what the real life is as your first job out there where, you know, nobody's holding your hand. I want you to spe- experience the real world. You know what I mean? And that's my yeah. rule for me because, you know, I, when I moved to the States, I had, you know, quote unquote, those type of jobs. And I think it, it helped shape who I am today. I don't take it for granted at all. So, yeah, I think that, I think the best job I had to make me a better salesperson, better marketer, I was a server. Yeah, I mean, me too. I waited tables. <laughs> and there's nothing that teaches you that kind of immediate, how to handle problems, how to talk with people, how to talk with anybody, even if you don't really want to, even when you're tired, even when you're hungover, yep. uh, <laughs> even when the food is bad coming out of the kitchen, how do you make that work? Yeah. Uh, you just so many life skills. Uh, uh, and yeah, you can get that at a lot of different types of jobs, but you need that, you need that job where you're in it, you're working with your hands and you've got to kind of think on your feet and yeah, it's exhausting. Uh, yeah. but heck you're young. Exactly. You know, that's, so. it just, that's the and, time to do it. I don't want and, to do it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and at that point you're like, Oh my God, I hate it. But then you look back, I look back down. I'm like, man, we had, <laughs> yeah, had it was horrible when I was hungover. It was exhausting. And yes, I worked every weekend, but you know what? I had such a the restaurant business, it's its own beast, man. I had a, I had a, I had a lot of good times. I'm not gonna lie there. So, uh, if you've never yeah. been in the restaurant business, just watch the movie Waiting. I think that represent represents it very well. Uh, so you were hanging out with dad. I mean, you were in marketing, inside yeah. marketing, like the Mad Men era, which is really cool. Uh, you know, so where where did it go from there? You you got the skills. You were paying attention. Where did it go from there? Yeah, you know, I I went to college. I I was going to be an engineer. I thought that's kind of what I wanted to do. I love to build things. Uh, I love to figure things out. I thought, yeah, that's uh, I wanted to be an engineer. And what happened was, I took all the physics, I took all the chemistry, I took all the uh, the math, the the calculus. And what I learned was, I wasn't really happy doing that. I I, I, people were fascinating to me. The tech was nice and I, I wanted to learn it. I didn't want to be intimidated by it, but the people were the interesting thing. So I switched gears and I went into advertising like my dad. I did graduate with a degree. I went to grad school. I did post-grad stuff. I, uh, I got a lot of the education, invaluable stuff, uh, but it was always about kind of a means to the end. It was, you know, when I went to grad school, it was all about how do I make myself better? Uh, so it was very much about, I, I felt like I didn't have, I, you know, I didn't have skills that I, you know, I wanted an opportunity to really dive deep with other people and just learn new things. Uh, but so, yeah, I mean, over, over that time I went into, I've been, most of my careers and been in product development, product launch. Uh, I do a lot of promotional marketing as you can probably guess as well, mm-hmm. but most of my career has been in, hey, I want to launch this new product, this new service. I want to kind of get this thing to the next level. What do we do? And that's exciting to me. I just, I love new things. I like starting new things. I've got two entrepreneurial ventures, as well as writing a book, as well as working for clients. I, I'm an ADD case for sure. Me too, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah. I know you can. I, I bet there are a lot of people listening who can totally relate to this. That yeah, absolutely. It is okay to have, I, I kind of consider it a portfolio career, you know, where it, would it be smart if you were thinking about your money? 
would you invest all your money in one company, no matter how good that company was? And the answer is no, that'd be kind of foolish. You'd want to make sure that you had a diversified portfolio of investments just in case any one of them went in the toilet. You'd, you know, maybe there'd be another one that would be doing well. You wouldn't lose everything. You know, I, I know a lot of people get fired from their job or get laid off or whatever, and they're just, they're, they're, they're destroyed by that. Because their whole identity was wrapped up in the job they were working at. And I, no, nah, it's just not for me. It's not that I don't sympathize. I don't love people. But man, I just, I, I wish they would view it uh, differently and just have more things going on to catch them when they fall. Yeah. I mean, I made that mistake in 2009 when the economy crashed. I had all my eggs in one basket. I mean, the plan was to diversify there. at some point. And I still remember my dad telling me, it's like, do not put your eggs in one basket. Do not. Put I'm yeah. like, I'm fine. I'm, I'm freaking crushing it. I'm like 23 on top of the world, making so much money. And uh, eventually I'll get to it. You know what I mean? But I was too busy partying and all that. And then the boom, we all know what happened in 2009. I got hit hard. Uh, Learn my lesson. Now everything is diversified. So if something goes down, I'm taken care of. Uh, but yeah, it's a different... Uh, mentality and mindset you have to develop but interesting that you were going into engineering because uh i i talk about it on here all the time engineers man you guys just staying completely different than normal people like me which is great it's a huge advantage it's a huge advantage uh even when it comes to putting i mean you can apply it to anything you know you can apply it to designing you know a, and you can't see this but like you know a <laughs> cup per se you know like a anything, my monitor, my keyboard, you know, whatever. And you can make it amazing like Elon and, you know, he's an engineer. So he comes up with all yeah. these fantastic ideas and he has, he knows, he understands his teams and that's how he makes it happen. But it's interesting to me that you apply with marketing because you have the, how do I say it? Uh, you're, you're smart enough to be an engineer because let's face it, to be an engineer, you have to be a very smart and analytical person, but you grew up with a mix of marketing being in there. So you mix both of them together and, and we got you, which is amazing. So like, you know, the book, I mean, I read some of it and it's just like, I, I mean, I can tell just the detail in it. You know what I mean? Like you put the details in it and that takes time and it, it takes a very uh, critical, logical thinking person to put it together. I've, I've been offered to write books and I'm like, I can't do it, man. I can't do it. Like, I can talk into a microphone all day, but if you ask me to say, it's not going to happen. Uh, and I don't think I don't ha have anything interesting enough yet to to re to make a book. You know what I mean? I'm not going to do uh, it just to do it. I, d uh, I didn't have I, I, I don't know. I, I, I still I don't feel like it was I had interesting things to say. I felt like there were stories that needed to be told. Yeah. And that was what was interesting to me. I mean, uh, to me, the it, being an engineer is, yeah, there's skills that you need and there's kind of tech that you need in order, you know, you, you need the calculus, you need the physics, you need all of those things to be an engineer. But the most important thing you need is a mindset. Like what is that kind of problem solution kind of mindset? What did like, uh, you know, from an Einstein, for instance, one of the, one of the neat things he said is if I had five minutes to solve a problem, I'd spend four minutes figuring out what the problem is. And then I one minute that. on the solution. And it's just that mindset of, okay, how do I think about the problem? How do I think about the stories I needed to tell in marketer in chief? What were the problems? How did they solve them? And taking a kind of a, you know, reductive sort of approach to get all the details. And then kind of that creative side that, you know, we, we all have all the people listening here have is like, how do I take all those details and create a story that people want to read? And that will, that will, you know, persuade people or convince people or educate people, whatever your goal is, that's what that kind of creative mindset is really all about is how do I take, like, uh, our human brains are too limited to take everything in. How do we just, how do we craft a story that really makes sense to people? That's what I tried to do in the book is make it interesting. I didn't want people to read anything like it anywhere else. If they're like, ah, oh, it's a history book. I, yeah, you know, I, 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 I've read history books before. They're just a, it's nap time. Like no way. No, it's not. No, I, I wanted it to be, it, it's so relevant. How do I make it relevant? So that when you read a chapter, you're like, yeah, I can, I can relate to that. I can, that, that speaks to me in some way. I could take something from that. That's my goal. If I didn't, if I didn't feel like I could get that in every chapter, I rewrote it. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't read the whole thing, obviously, but, uh, you know, I, I read some part of it and it, it's really it grabs you right away. So let me let me ask you a question. Who's your favorite president so far and why? Especially wow. since you were putting the, the, the book together. Yeah, that's like uh, it. And it's this not is like, like I'm not trying to turn this political. I'm just no, 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 no. I, I think the I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to answer that with which president surprised me the most. Like which one did I have maybe a negative opinion of that turned like the, the amount of change based on what I learned. And that's it's going to blow some people away to hear this. But Herbert Hoover, let me let me explain who this guy was. If you know anything about Herbert Hoover at all, he was the guy who presided over the Great Depression. So when the stock market crashed and Hoovervilles and people living in the streets, it was bad. The whole thing was bad. We tend to think Herbert Hoover was this kind of uncaring, kleptocrat, kind of a mess. But when you actually read about the guy, if he had been elected eight years earlier, he might have been our one of our best presidents ever. Uh, and... Why is that? He was, he presided, uh, he was an engineer, by the way. He was a mining was. engineer. Yep. Okay. By trade. One of the smartest people. He was in the inaugural class at Stanford. You know, wow. the, the first class. And he met his wife. His wife also was a engineer, a graduate, and they married and, you know, stayed together forever. So two engineers, two really, really, really smart people. And they went, he was the person who helped feed the Belgian people uh, during World War I when he, you know, coordinating all the relief supplies into Belgium. Uh, he was the guy who coordinated all of the efforts as the first ever Secretary of Commerce to figure out, like, we've got this new thing called cars. You know, Ford was coming out with stuff. Everyone was coming out with cars, but there were no rules for the road. There was no rules for that industry. <laughs> I never even thought about that. I know. Yeah. It's crazy, no right? Rules. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like, imagine being downtown Manhattan with effing horses and Model Ts <laughs> going everywhere and people walking and no rules. I mean, yeah. It was deadly to be, to be in a road anywhere. He brought all the people together That's to Miami. help figure out how to do that. He was the first person who figured out we should have a federal aviation administration because we got this new thing called planes and we should support this technology. We should get this off the ground. If he were alive today, he'd be bringing people together to figure out how do we deal with this crypto thing? We got to do something about crypto right now. You know, we have to figure out how we incorporate this into our economy versus having like dogs on coins and shit. I mean, <laughs> this is... Uh, it, it, he was the kind of leader that you need during technological disruption because his view was, I want to bring people together, get everybody in a room, listen to, he was smart enough to be able to listen to all the different points of view and craft something where the government could support this technology. There are just so many examples like that from him in the 20s during the Harding and Coolidge administrations where learning about him now is just mind blowing. And he's the kind of person, he was only one of two engineers who became president. And it makes uh, it, it makes you think like how bad we need that now. You know? Oh, oh yeah. I don't, care, I don't care who you like. I don't care which side you're on. The fact that, you know, you, you see these hearings with Zuckerberg and, and, you know, the guy, I forget the Jack from Twitter and, and they go in there and all these guys that are like basically in their 80s at this point, it's like they have no idea how any of this stuff works. They're so far behind. And even presidents, you know, whether it, again, whether it's Trump, Biden, whoever, like they're just they have no clue, man. They have no yeah. clue. They don't keep up with any of this stuff that they, they have no basic knowledge of technology. Now we have this massive crypto movement that's been going on for a while and now it's really starting to take off and then you throw nfts on top of it and you know social media and it's like you know i, I mean you've seen it you know what i'm talking yeah, about it's absolutely like, you need people. Scary. yeah you need people you need leaders who uh, they don't uh, you know uh herbert hoover was a mining engineer he didn't know anything about cars. He didn't know anything about planes. He didn't know anything about the electromagnetic spectrum, which became regulated at that time as well. He didn't know anything about the consumer economy with the Sears catalog and all that. What he did have, though, was a mindset that allowed him to know how to learn about those other things. And 
I just wonder, you know, instead of hiring lawyers and politicians, should we be hiring engineers to be politicians? Oh, you know, do we need at least some of them in there to be able to help understand the kind of change that we're going through? So I would just invite listeners, if you have not learned about Herbert Hoover, you can certainly go to my book and you can check that out for sure. I, I kind of give you a, a breakdown, but there are books out there. Make sure to rethink kind of what you think you learned and what you think you knew about people like that. That, that, was the, that was maybe the best thing for me in writing the book was I got to learn about you know, things I just didn't know about these people and how relevant their stories really are to us. You know, at, you know after time, like I, that's kind of my biggest criticism of, of history courses and what we learn in, in you know, high school and college or wherever in most books, frankly, is there's kind of a narrative that kind of it's this n big narrative arc, like oh, there was the Revolutionary War and the Civil War, and then World War One and Two, and it's usually about wars, and it's usually about kind of we only pay attention to a few different people. Well, yeah, that's you know that's great, that's better than nothing, but it's not enough. And if you want to be kind of a, frankly, if you I I want to people to read the book and say, I can be, not only can I think about history in a better way, if I'm a marketing person, I can be a lot better because mm -hmm. I've got 45 role models, whether I like them or not. Yeah. Uh, they were role models. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's funny that you bring that up about, you know, these guys in the past, but I remember sitting in college and oh man, like American history was just like, it would just put me to bed. Like as soon as they started, I was just like out, you know, like it was a fighting I don't even know how to call it. Just me fighting just to stay awake because, you know, I was, you know how kids are, man. Like, yeah, you, for I was sure. tired. I would stay up every night. I would go out, blah, blah, blah. And then American history at freaking 8 a.m. or whatever it was. And, uh, but I'll never forget this time that we were in class and, and the professor was one of those guys that was just so boring that didn't even make it interesting. That didn't help either. Uh, and we got talking. I, I'll never forget this. They were talking about Rockefeller. And, uh, and I never care about Rockefeller, especially at that time. Uh, and the only thing I heard out of that whole semester was that he was playing golf with someone and he was closing a deal and he was worth like billions of dollars at that time, whatever right. it was. And I don't remember the tech number or anything like that. I still to this. And for some reason that stuck with me. I'm like, holy shit, like this guy, like billions of dollars at that time, you know, at that point, like, that's crazy. We barely have any billionaires now. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking about this in the the nineties or whatever when I was in college. And then I got around to reading, uh, Titan, the story of Rockefeller. And I, I just read it. Like, I think it was like six months ago or something like that. I just, I need to, I just decided to pick it up. Huh? You know what? I should, this guy did something right at some point. So let me check it out what his life right. was like. Right. And I remember buying the audiobook and it was like 36 hours long. I'm like, oh boy, this is gonna be a, this is gonna be a hard one. Uh, but you know, I usually listen to it at the gym. And if you read that book or listen to it, it's called Titan, uh, the biography of Rockefeller. It's everything you need to know in business. Like yeah. just the way he managed his money. Uh, he basically created the Uber of like oil refineries. He's like, oh, everybody's pumping oil. No, that's not where the money's at. I'm going to be the Microsoft. I'm going to build the refineries and have like the whole network that's going to, you know, refine the oil. You know, it was like, and then it got into like the cars. Yeah, he was involved with the car, you know, with Ford and all that stuff. And it's like, he he basically blew up the uh, the railroad system here in America. I mean, I'm telling you, if you read it and pay attention uh, you know, there's some boring parts, I'm not gonna lie, but to the way, the way he raised his kids, like, and the way he was with his money, it, it I'm telling you, man, it's one of the, that's one of those books I wish I read when I was a teenager. That's all I got to say. It just, it, it, yeah. it gives you an insight of how some of those people, you know, they, how they, they thought back then or still to this day. And that's why they became as rich as they were, you know, and the guys like booked that billion and he was still cheap, man. He was still counting every penny. I love yeah. that. <laughs> that's, so. that's something you find very common in, you know, people who are wealthy in that way, who, you know, kind of came from very little or came from nothing. Right. Uh, you know, they might be a billionaire and, you know, they're still drinking Budweiser, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. You know, no craft beer for them. It's whatever's on sale. 
my buddy and I were joking around and we were out, uh, I don't know, a few months ago and he's doing very, very well. And he came here as an immigrant with nothing from Venezuela where I moved here from. Luckily I had a, you know, I grew up well. So, uh, but he came here with nothing. And now he has a job where, you know, he's in sales for Latin America here in South Florida. He makes, you know, like 250K a year. So, I mean, that's amazing, right? And we were joking. He's like, oh, yeah, dude. He's, he tells us, like, the more money I make, the less I spend. I'm like, yeah, me too, man. It's funny <laughs> how that works. He's like, when I was broke, I would buy all this stupid stuff. And now it's like, no. <laughs> like, I learned my lesson a long time ago. It's a different yeah. mindset when you work hard for it, too, because he works really hard. You know, he... He, I mean, he, I remember he was a, uh, a bellhopper at the W in South Beach, you know, when he first moved here. And now he has a job making 250K a year. And he's amazing. I mean, only here in America, right? Yeah, that's, that's the thing. That's kind of what I, the, the story I wanted to help tell is that there are a lot of people who criticize the United States, rightfully so. Because they never I, lived anywhere else. <laughs> that's what yeah, I said. That's, yeah, that's, that's one of the things, uh, obviously. But, What's interesting about the United States and what I think it's easy to forget is that, hey, if you don't like it, don't move. No, if you don't like it, change it. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the, this is one of the few places where, yeah, it may take time. You might have to convince other people to change with you. Uh, you might have to work really hard at it, but you can change it. There are a lot of places in the world uh, where, no, you you don't really have an opportunity to change things. If you don't like how it is, good luck. Look at Venezuela. That's where I moved. That's where my family moved here from. I mean, my Italian family moved there for the oil boom in the 50s. We lived there in the 80s. I tell people all the time, the 80s over there where I grew up, it was amazing. It was like the U.S., everything you wanted, you know, the flashy cars, the houses. I mean, it was money everywhere. If you have a quarter of a brain and you did something with oil, guess what? You became a millionaire. And then, you know, became socialist. And now it's a full-blown dictatorship where people don't even have food anymore. It's crazy. And over there, you can't change it. Here, we can. We have a voice. There's laws in place where you can, you know, make it happen. So it's like, you know, I don't want to get too deep into this stuff. But, you know, I, I think some of these people in Congress and Senate, that there should be terms where you're there for like X amount of years and that's it. Next, bring somebody young, man. I mean, AOC, I don't agree we, with 90% of the stuff she says. Uh, you know, but I'm glad we have somebody like that in there, you know, a fresh young person. That's, that's all I care about, you know, fresh ideas. And, and there's going to be two sides to the coin all the time. And, you know, it's, I, I think that's the way it should be, but, uh, I don't know. That's just my thought on that. Let's go back to the book though. So when, when doing the research for the book and putting everything together, uh, as far as marketing goes, so now you told us your, your, your favorite president as far as an analytical and the way he thought and the way he ran things, but in a marketing sense of way, the way he sold himself, who was your favorite that you found when putting everything together for the book, which is yeah. available on Amazon, by the way, I'll put the link. It is. Yeah. Uh, audio book as well. So, uh, yeah. you know, if you'd rather listen, uh, it was written to be, to be heard as well as read. So, uh, I, I wanted to make sure I did that. Here's the thing, like who, you know, who communicated, you know, who really kind of positioned and communicated themselves the best. There's definitely kind of a top tier, you know, there's a few. And a lot of times, you know, really Christian, it's the, it's the people we sort of think of because it's the ones that come top of mind are usually the ones that communicated the best. Think about who we're thinking about. You think about, well, Ronald Reagan, the great communicator. You can agree or disagree with Ronald Reagan in a lot of different ways, and it is very legitimate to do so. But one thing even his detractors admit is that he understood how to communicate. He understood how to craft an image. He understood the difference between kind of his spoken word and how he appeared, just even the photo backgrounds he chose. Uh, all of those sorts of things uh, were really key. But let's go back. Most people wouldn't they think like, oh, like Abraham Lincoln, awesome, great communicator. They read his speeches. We carve his speeches in stone. They're that good. Here's the thing. What most people don't know about Abraham Lincoln is that's not what made him famous at the time. Okay? What made him such a great communicator at the time was he was fucking funny. He was, really? a, he was hysterical. 
That's what people <laughs> That's loved awesome. about him. That he would tell jokes all the time. Like he was, he could be serious and he could give those kind of soaring speeches. And that's kind of what we remember. But if you would have asked people in the 1850s and 1860s, well, what did they think about Abraham Lincoln? How did they know him? They're like, oh man, he made me feel like I, I was just, I felt great to be around him. He was just that funny guy that you wanted to be around. He'd crack jokes that weren't like, biting jokes about other people they were just kind of like he was kind of like the jerry seinfeld of his day that's just kind of funny observations uh, and that's what i chose to wrote write about in the book is his sense of humor and how good he was at it was and it, you kind of breaking down like how he was funny why he was funny what did what did he do what did he not do just crazy good at humor and that's what that's what people loved about him at the time. And we kind of forget about that stuff because like, well, jokes don't age well, you know, yeah. but it, how was he able to kind of communicate with people and really kind of get them on his side and kind of hold things together? People loved him and they loved him because he was funny and they just wanted to be around him. He brought them joy. You know, that was it. It's one of those things. It's one of those lessons you learn from history when you actually read the source material and you go back and you, you you don't say well what do we in 2021 2022 think about abraham lincoln in 1860 like well no what did people in 1860 think about abraham lincoln why did they like him that's the lesson for marketing people today and sales people today is not what we choose to remember but what was it like at the time and that was it was my one of my favorite chapters to write because i got to read his joke books fantastic really i gotta find really this. good stuff <laughs> find yeah stuff. you can read books you can just hit amazon and in the book i link to all of those books so you can go get them but yeah. there are books on abraham lincoln's humor and jokes and they're hysterical most of them hold up really really well really? today but it's funny how you bring that up about uh lincoln and it makes you think about why you know why a lot of people like trump well he tells it like it is and you know trump will say like a funny thing a, a funny thing here and there he was a madman he will go in there he will, he had nicknames for everybody whether it was disrespectful or whatever but that's why he did and then people gravitated towards that right um so marketing let's let's talk a little bit about marketing because we're, we're gonna run out of time soon <laughs> and it's a great conversation i love podcasts like this um so the marketing hasn't changed. I tell people all the time, like people say, digital, I specialize in digital marketing. I'm like, no, you specialize in marketing. You're just using a digital right. tool to get it out there. If you, you got to learn real marketing to make it happen with digital or analog, whatever you want to call it. So, you know, obviously before social media, especially Facebook and all, all everything we have now, it was pretty much TV print, but the idea behind it was the same. Uh, we know, we both know we're in the business that Trump, Trump's team did an amazing job in the first election to, to get him elected. Uh, I knew that was going to happen from the first couple of weeks when I saw the spend on Facebook by itself. I was like, yeah. these people know what they're doing and they're going to win because I know all the micro targeting when it comes down to Facebook. I know how powerful it is. And 99% and of people out there have no clue. Uh, like Hillary, <laughs> she didn't take advantage of it. I can't believe they didn't. Uh, but before we get into the the Trump thing, before Trump, uh, before Facebook and all that, w which president, uh, president from doing your research is the one that you think did a best job of marketing themselves to the public using whatever uh, avenues they had, whether it was print, TV, or just getting out there? Who do you who do you think it was? Yeah, no question, Kelvin Coolidge. Really? Uh, That's yeah. not what I was expecting. No, no one would think <laughs> that, uh, but. At that time, you got to understand, at that time, like, professional advertising was just coming into its own. It was just becoming what a What year was this? I don't know. 1920s, 1920, okay. 20, you know, right around in there. Mm -hmm. uh, the Sears catalog was coming out. There's this whole, all these new innovations were coming out and advertising to generate demand for these new innovations was just becoming a thing. Well, Calvin Coolidge, along with Bruce Barton, Bruce Barton is one of the founders of BBDO. Uh, the okay. ad agency BBDO. Uh, wow. Bruce Barton is B in BBDO. Huh, uh, okay. So at that time, you know, he essentially packaged Calvin Coolidge like a product. 
he crafted his messages to appeal to women who were just getting the right to vote at that time, if we remember. He crafted messages to the African-American community, to different areas of the country. He micro-targeted and segmented. Uh, he crafted an image if he was going to be, yeah, he, that he was using magazines and photography and all of those things to craft an image of him as the president that the country wanted. He was the first person to do fireside chats, to be on the radio. People think it was uh, Franklin Roosevelt. It wasn't. Calvin Coolidge was the first one who went on the radio. And he, Bruce Barton was the one that told him, don't speak to them like you're speaking to this big crowd. Like They only have the radio and you. It's like you're in the room with them. Speak to them like you. Like you and I are doing this together. And if you and I work on this, it's not the president and the American people, it's you and me. Like, it sounds like a really simple sort of thing, but he was the person who crafted all of those techniques that we've been using ever since. Uh, so so cool. before then, presidents weren't, they really didn't market themselves that well. You know, they, you know, a lot of surrogates did that work for him. It was a very political process. After Coolidge, politics became mass marketing. Uh, we can either say, well, that was good or that was bad or whatever, but it's the truth. And uh, that has changed ever since. So if we think, well, when did all that start? Uh, 1920, Kelvin Coolidge. Wow, that's amazing. I'm going to have to look into that one too. That is so cool. So... That is so they were doing everything, you know, the segmenting, uh, split testing, and all that good stuff. Golden nugget that you brought up the Sears catalog. I tell my copywriters, read the Sears catalog from back in the day if you want to know how to write product descriptions for a website. Yeah, it still holds to this day. Yeah, that's uh, that era, the 19 for the catalog stuff, and the, and the 1950s, J. Peterson catalog, too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, those two. If you're a copywriter, copy. yeah, or you have a website. Check out the product descriptions and write yours like that. I'm telling you, it'll drive your conversion rate up. Um, all right, I'm running out of time. This sucks because I'm having fun. Let's get Trump. Let's talk about Trump because yeah. uh, to you, that was, uh, it's it, you know, being a marketer like me, I was like, as soon as I started seeing the spend, I was like, oh, dude, if they play their cards right with the micro targeting and the way, you know, with the content, he's going to, he's winning. He's going to win this thing. Yeah. And sure enough, it happened. And I have witnesses, which, I will tell him, I'm like, watch, dude, watch. This is what I do for a living with Facebook. So what was your first sign when the campaign started? Yeah, I'll, t I'll tell you uh, when- you Or even if you didn't think he was going to win, like what did you notice right away about the campaign that stood out? Because it stood out right away from anything else to me. Yeah, what I noticed right away was just being in, in marketing, you understand micro-targeting, you yeah. understand segmentation, and you right. understand that he's not trying to convince everybody they're only the way the United States system is set up. You there are only certain states that matter. Yeah. Now, if just kind of going at that state level is not enough, what I saw him start to do that the Clinton campaign didn't was not go at the state level. County. Like the, the Clinton campaign, yeah, they went to the county. Trump campaign went to the county. They went to the neighborhood. They went to the zip code. What they understood was. Here are the individual neighborhoods we need to tip over. And if we tip them over, we can get enough people to tip that congressional seat over or that state over. So in Washington, Ohio, Florida, Minnesota, the, the, there are the states in the United States where the Trump campaign knew, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in California. Uh, again, that's something that, was the, the philosophy for that was Bruce Barton's philosophy with Calvin Coolidge. He was the one that figured that out, that we don't need to target the nation. They don't do that. Yeah. They target not just the state. The state is key in the Electoral College. But within the state, there are certain swing districts, swing counties, swing households. How do you find the people? How do you activate them properly? is something that digital marketing could do that broadcast advertising just simply cannot do in the same way. And when I started to see that, and I saw that the Clinton campaign was not doing that and not doing it in the same way, I, you know, the predictable outcome was 
okay, uh, Donald Trump is playing a game of inches. Hillary Clinton's playing a game of miles. Boy, uh, you just knew that if it was close, Donald Trump was going to win. It's yeah. kind of what it came down to because that kind of digital ground game was better. Yeah, and fun fact for those of you that don't know, after that election, Facebook had to change its targeting absolutely <laughs> capabilities for political stuff because it was too micro targeted, and it's like you know it's not cool, I guess. But I remember, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I remember you could go in there and you can go to uh, the Facebook ads library and pull up like the candidates by spend. And I remember at one point I saw like the Trump campaign spending. I think it was something ridiculous, like forty eight million dollars in one month. And the Clinton campaign was a two and a half. I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, this yeah. is all you need to know right here. Uh, you know, and I just can't believe her team just ignored it completely. I'm like, how can you ignore Facebook? I mean, it's, it's, what do you think happened there? Any idea what happened there? It's, you know, it's tough to say. I think when you, when you think about the psychology inside both campaigns, uh, you know, and you think about the psychology inside the Clinton campaign at that time, where her candidacy and her presidency was very much seen as an inevitability. Yeah. And okay, it was just a matter of executing, don't screw it up, you know, just, you know, kind of check the boxes and get there. This guy that you're competing against is not up to the same level. It, he's basically a TV personality. There's, you just, just don't screw it up and you'll be okay. Well, it's just, it's, it's kind of like, what did I hear? I was watching The Good Place. Have you ever watched The Good Place, that, that show? And it was Jason Mendoza, that character, talking about prevent defense. And I he said, seen it, but yeah, he said the problem with prevent defense in American football is it just prevents you from winning. <laughs> and I feel like uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign was playing prevent defense with Donald Trump. Yeah. And it just isn't going to work. He's too much of a wild card for that. Right. You can't you can't do prevent on someone who's just going to run around you. Yeah. And I, unfortunately, I think it was a strategic error rather than a tactical error because the you know, the tactical stuff as you mentioned, there are a lot of tactical errors, but you can get away with a fair number of tactical errors and still win. But if you mess up the strategic approach, you're done. Right. And unfortunately, I think that's that's what happened to the Clinton campaign, uh, you know, at that time. They just from a marketing one on one perspective, if someone else is spending fifty million and you're spending two, you better have a damn good reason. Uh, you better have a counter strategy to that, and they didn't. And that's I think, unfortunate. I personally think they just got cocky. It's like, oh, we got this. This guy's crazy. Like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, you, he just added his his team just added fuel to the fire. And they did. I mean, he had a good agency behind it. Uh, the guy's from here, from South Florida, actually. He got in trouble not too long ago for. <laughs> yeah, no, no uh, surprise there. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, South Florida, it's its own world. OK, <laughs> but I love yeah, it. I know. So, I got I got family down there. Yeah, I love uh, it. The Cubans. Um, but interesting, uh, Biden, you know, the, the re-election or whatever. Well, I shouldn't call it a re-election because Biden won, uh, you know. Uh, they did use the same strategy online, the Trump campaign for, you know, for the net, for the second term. But Biden still won. So what do you think happened there? I mean, people who just wanted to change. Yeah, that's it's tough. You know, when you're when you're a disruptor and Trump is a disruptor, Obama was as well. Trump, you know, Trump reminds you of P.T. Barnum. You know, if you read yeah. about P.T. Barnum, that's who that's who Trump is. It's it's literally to the T. If you read a, a biography of P.T. Barnum, it's exactly down to a T. It's it's his playbook. Everything he does, and, and it comes down to P.T. Barnum, in my opinion, at least. You know. Yeah, it's a, it's a good historical analog for sure. Yeah. yeah. And you know, it was P.T. Barnum who said you can fool some of the people some of the time, you know, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. <laughs> Yeah, You know, and what happens is when you've got that kind of, you run that kind of campaign and you're disruptive and you create a lot of enemies, uh, which he did, it's very difficult to sustain that. You know, if you get into office that way and then you can deliver on things, uh, it, it's tough though, Christian, you know, one thing about, you know, history, just when you, when you look at it, the air, one of the errors in looking at history is that because it happened a certain way is that it had to happen that way. And that it was, 
like that, you know, we came within 50, 60,000 votes of Hillary Clinton becoming president. Uh, it was not a preordained conclusion that Joe Biden would win. Had, uh, for example, had Trump better handled the coronavirus pandemic in the general public mind, whether or not the you can kind of debate the actuals however you want, just the perception was that he ignored it and didn't pay attention to it. Had he just paid a little bit of attention to it, taken a little bit more seriously from a perception standpoint, might he have won again? Uh, reasonably likely. You know, it's uh, it, it's one of those things where, yeah, just because the way things turned out the way they did uh, doesn't mean they had to. And we were really close to, you know, a Clinton presidency, close to another Trump presidency. Most elections, when you kind of look back, most of them are actually pretty close. Yeah. They're not, most of them are not blowouts. Like people forget, like, like the only kind of, there are only a few elections that were basically uncontested. George Washington, a couple of times, you know, kind of Ma the Madison Monroe era was pretty, you know, was pretty uncontested. There aren't, there aren't very many other ones. Uh, you know, when you think about uh, uh, Nixon Kennedy, for instance, that race was decided by less than a hundred, like less than about a hundred thousand votes, uh, yeah. less than 1%. Uh, the Bush, uh, when Bush won yeah, by Bush like, Gore, uh, yeah, Bush Gore, that's what it was. Actually, the common thing is that elections are close. The common thing is that the United States is not red and blue. It is very, very, very purple. Yeah. You know, when you, even in Minneapolis where I live, if you look at the breakdown, you think, oh, well, it's completely blue. It's all Democrats. You know, there aren't any Republicans here. It's absolutely not true. Uh, and it's not true in the deeply red districts that there are no uh, there are no Democrats. The best you might get is 65, 35. That's not 99 percent. That's not like when people think about like, oh, it's a red district. You forget that probably one out of three people or more kind of voted for the other person. I never looked uh, at that one, but yeah, makes it's, sense. Yeah, it's just really important to think about how purple we really are. Uh, uh, you know, in the United States and kind of act accordingly. And that's why I think kind of that marketing perspective helps us is that by understanding that you can't, you can't think of people as these big kind of conglomerations. You have to think about people as small groups that are going to behave certain ways for certain things and other ways for other things. And that people can be contradictory they can buy the latest new car, but keep their smartphone until it breaks. Yeah. You know, people will do uh, things for their own reasons. They'll be irrational. All the things that marketing folks do, like we understand this stuff. A lot of times when we think it's, it's like our brain shuts off when we think about politics and we think that people aren't people and people aren't contradictory and weird and do weird things yeah. and hold contradictory, strange beliefs absolutely do and we should spend more time listening and kind of less time kind of speaking and we will do better in uh we'll do better politics and be better we're better marketing people if we do it that way absolutely so one last question before we go since uh you brought up crypto earlier how long do you think it'll be before someone comes up hey guys can we put this whole voting thing on a blockchain so we don't have to recount anything and it's all in a ledger from day one? <laughs> do you think do you think that it has to happen at some yeah, point? Yeah, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. I I uh, I suspect, like I said, I think if we had like someone like a Herbert Hoover, we'd have mm -hmm. that already. Right. Uh, but part of that's a bit inevitable in terms of transparency. Uh, and you know, you want faith in an election. Make it completely open, no boxes. Anyone can read it at any time. Full transparency, full transparency in our commercial lives. You know, there's that that whole balance with privacy. That like, oh, we've got privacy. Privacy appears nowhere in the U.S. Constitution, by the way. Yeah. Just FYI, for after people. after 9/11, there's no privacy either. Yeah. So you think Facebook's bad? Yeah, good luck. Yeah, I just <laughs> I just think we you know. 
privacy is kind of a new invention of the industrial revolution. You know, people before then who lived in villages up, up until what is that book from uh, 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 Diamond is the world until yesterday. Great book. Never Basically done. said until the industrial revolution, we didn't have a concept of privacy. We didn't, you lived with about 150 other people in a village or small community. Uh, you had no privacy. There was no concept no. of that. And we are starting to kind of move back to that. And that's really, that's tough for people because like, ah, I don't want people to see me. It's like, well, yeah, but if we, we give up our privacy all the time for conveniences, you know, yeah, we, 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 we give our privacy of where we are so that we can have GPS technology. And we make that trade off because we're like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. I get value for that. Yeah. So that's all coming. And frankly, if we were having this conversation in China, it wouldn't matter at all. <laughs> uh, Absolutely. They, yeah. you know, uh, the government there monitors everything. That's just yeah. the way it is. So it's kind of this weird little United Statesy kind of thing where mm -hmm. privacy is a thing. It's not a thing most other places. Listen, in the world. if you want privacy, get rid of your phone, then get on a plane, then land somewhere and then change your identity and then go through like three different countries and then end up in the middle of nowhere with no technology. And, that, and still, I'm sure there's a camera somewhere that's going to catch your face and you're right in a database. I hate to break there's, it to you, but if yeah, you have there's a driver's a satellite. license. Those yeah, military yeah. satellites are good. Exactly. So. They'll find you. <laughs> anyway, Jason, thank you so much, man. Uh, well, great you, conversation. Uh, this is one of my favorites for sure. Too bad we're out of time. But uh, people, if you want to read the book, I only read a, a few excerpts from it. I haven't had a, a chance to read the whole thing. Uh, but the book is called Marketer in Chief, How Each President Sold the American Idea. So if you're in marketing and if you, and if you like history, man, it's the perfect mix for sure. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. I'll have the link down in the description. And Jason, where can people find you at? Yeah, the easiest place, marketerinchief.com is a place to learn about the book learn a little bit about me. That's cool. But if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, I'm there. Twitter, I'm there. Other places, not so much there, but <laughs> uh, you know, I'm a business person. So I'm on yeah. LinkedIn. Find me, connect with me. Let's talk. Yeah, there you go. And I'll, again, I'll put the links in the description and everybody watching, everybody listening. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll see you guys in the next episode. Thanks again, Jason. Thanks a lot, Christian. Take care.